Hello everyone and welcome to Pilots on the Fly. I'm Captain Bob Dallas. No, I'm not an actual pilot. I'm an aviation enthusiast, but if you're looking for a real pilot, I can get you one in a jiffy. He's, sit he's sitting right next to me right here. He's not only my good friend, he's also my coach. He coaches me on the Ask Pilot Bob capsules. He's always giving me some good advice. And he's my co-star and co-host, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Cartwright. Hello, glad y'all could join us. Captain, so fun to have you with us. Uh, again, it's a promising show. We have a lot of uh, nice things to talk about tonight. Uh, just before we went live um, on the, the TikTok audience, we have the privilege of uh, coming on live with us 10 minutes before we go into the show. We were talking about the shortage with the pilots, and that's something that's still happening right now, as you were saying, Captain. Definitely sure is. And there's a lot of different things that uh, they're saying that cause the pilot shortage. And uh, one of them is the 1500 hour rule that uh, it requires a pilot um, for an airline to, to, to get 1500 hours before they can get their ATP license. And ATP is what's considered the airline transport pilot's license to be able to become an airline pilot. So 1,500 hours is what it takes in the United States to do that. And uh, that's a pretty lot of hours um, when it comes to building time. Okay, so when we're talking about 1,500 hours, uh, uh, can you elaborate for us, Haas? Uh, what does it mean exactly? Is that from the moment you are actually uh, signed up, you're taking your theory classes? Does that include the flying time, flying time alone? What is the 1,500 hours exactly? Well, let's talk about becoming a pilot and uh, we'll work up to that. First thing you've got to do is get your private pilot's license and that's at least 40 hours. Then after that, you're going to get your what's called an instrument rating and that's at least another 40 hours. So to get your commercial license on top of that to be able to fly for hire is your commercial license is your next step is 250 hours. Then your next step above that is going to be your airline transport pilot license and that requires 1,500 of flight hours to be able to do that. Now, multiple people gain their hours in different ways. I was able, I was a lucky one to be able to gain my hours just by flying by owning planes since college. And I didn't become an ATP rated pilot until I was 45. Um, so I had 21 years of flying before I became an ATP pilot. Um, so anyway, outside of that, that 1500 hour rule came about because of the families and victims of the Kogan air crash back in 2009 made a concerted effort to lobby um, the FAA to implement this rule, and it's it's a kind of a kind of a weird rule. Now, I think um, as far as the rules go, it's not a bad rule, um, but they do. There's a lot of people that have considered this being the biggest uh, problem with uh, getting new pilots to come into the field because of the expense of getting that 1,500 hours. Uh, and again, multiple people do it. Once you get your commercial rating, a lot of people go to their CFI to do it. Then they start teaching people how to fly. And then they'll typically spend three to five years teaching people how to fly to gain enough power and, and uh, time to be able to get that 1,500 hours in to, to go to their airline transport side of it. Well, uh, getting those 1,500 hours may not be easy for everybody because every time you got to bring the plane up, it costs some money. Uh, I know of some people, uh, they bring some friends. Hey, you want to go fly with me? They bring maybe two or three friends, and they're the ones who split the expense to take the plane up in, into the air so he can get his hours. Is that, does it work the same in the U.S.? Well, um, when you're not a commercial pilot and you're not flying under a commercial license, um, doing one of multiple ways to fly, you can fly the 135 World or you can fly a Part 91 uh, 41, uh, like, uh, sightseeing tours type of flights. So the two, that's the typical two other ways that you can gain hours, but you're, somebody else is paying for the time that you're flying the airplane. Same thing with a CFI. So when, when you're a certified flight instructor, you're teaching somebody else and they're paying for the plane time plus your time. So when it comes to, uh, shared expense, a lot of people like to do that to be able to get to their 250 hours to become a commercial pilot. So the 250 hours is on top of the 80 that we mentioned earlier, the, the 40 for the private pilot, and then the other 40 for the instrument rating. And then you've got to come up with a lot of hours after that to get your 250 together to take your commercial pilot's license. 
So a lot of people do what's called a shared shared expense flight. Now in America, you can split the you can split the cost between three people evenly, and because you're not really a commercial pilot at that point, you're a private pilot still. Um, if you're taking two thirds, or the two people are paying the one guy to fly the airplane here in America, that is actually illegal. Oh, okay. So that I was about to ask you that. If it's uh, if it's legal to do that in the states, well, I'm talking about this. This is something that happened like a long time ago. Maybe the rules have changed here too. Yeah, I don't know the Canadian rules on that, so it's uh, a little different here in the states. So okay, so uh, someone uh, gets his uh, pilot license, license and starts flying, but then again, the first jobs he's going to be getting are not necessarily high wages. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, typically, a CFI will earn about uh, twenty to forty dollars an hour doing uh, pilot training here in the states. Wow! Now, if they're flying sightseeing tours, they're going to get probably about the same twenty to forty dollars an hour. So it just depends. Um, a lot of people do uh, other types of jobs as well, but um, it's usually not very high pay. Going to the airlines is, is usually typically where the good pay starts. So the screening process is someone who leaves uh, uh, pilot school, then he goes on to leave uh, to work for these uh, private companies, and he finally makes it. Uh, he's hired as a first officer for a commercial airline. But the screening he's got to go through, the, the tests he's got to, is that a pass are enormous. I mean, they just they just just don't take anybody like that, right? I mean, well, you have to go uh, the right? You're talking about on the initial. That you're I, talking I about know. on the initial hiring process of an airline. That's right, an airline hiring. Let's say uh, I don't know, I mean many airline, but airline Z hiring this new guy. Uh, he's qualified. This new lady. Uh, she's going to start the training, but before she becomes um, part of the payroll, she's going to be hired as a pilot. The screening process, I mean, the tests they have to pass before they're hired, they must be ignored. There must be a lot of testing. Well, typically, the first thing that happens when you're uh, going to uh, apply for a job at the airlines, you're going to put in an application on a website, and then you're going to have to go through a uh, screening process. And that screening process includes several tests. It's basically there's some math tests to it. There's some psychological tests to it. And there's also some just uh, general knowledge tests to it. So they're actually testing you a lot of different ways when you go through those initial screenings, when you fill out that initial um, application to work there. So you've got to really pass all those things before they'll even call you for to get an interview. Well, uh, th that sounds a lot like, uh, of course, the implications are not the same. It's not the same kind of job. But I remember when I went for my city bus driver job, I had to go through countless, countless tests. It was like uh, uh, psychological tests, uh, physical tests. It, it was like, like, oh, my God, this is like ridiculous. You know, asking you what the uh, the uh, the baby, uh, what a baby cow is called, uh, and, and what a cloud like above forty thousand feet. Well, I, I guess no clouds up there, but a, a cloud above uh, ten thousand feet. Will you call that? And if there's an air mass coming in, I go. I'm a bus driver. I, I don't know about this stuff. So, okay. if, what, and, and I'm asking myself, why are they asking all these questions? I mean, it's ridiculous. It's not pertinent. You know, it's not fair. I may lose out of the job because I don't know what you call a baby cow. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> well, and that, that's uh, that's just the first process of getting in the door to becoming an airline pilot. Now, the second process, once you get that initial interview, there will be a multiple panel interview. The interview will include an HR interview which will basically be a lot of, they'll ask you a lot of what if questions and stuff like that. You will have some um, scenario based interview questions by usually the chief pilot, maybe the chief training officer or something like that in the company um, to see if you're going to be able to answer some basic questions as well. Some scenario questions of like, what if the captain shows up in the cockpit and you smell alcohol on his breath? And now that might be an HR question, but that's also a scenario question of saying, all right, how would you handle the situation? 
So, and then there's also situations of maybe fuel management. Okay, you've got to divert from an aircraft, and what was what is your resources to be able to handle that diversion, and how would you go about because you can't land at the one aircraft airport that is now closed due to the weather. Right. And so they want, they want you to walk through the process of that stuff as a part of that interview. Now, once you get past the interview section and you actually get an offer letter, then you have to go through several background checks. The one is a driving test background check as well, because they want to check your uh, DMV records to make sure you haven't got uh, reckless driving, um, too many speeding tickets, uh, a lot of risk taking activity or something like that. That will also tell the airline and um, typically uh, who's hiring you, whether you're um, whether you've got good enough character or not to maybe take the risk on hiring this person. So you've got that type of uh, stuff that you're going to go through. And then you've got the training, which has just happened here recently. Um, they've called a, it's a PREA uh, training records database. And that database basically has all your training records from the beginning all the way to your current status of where you're at. And that's, that's something that has been a result of several airlines crashes as well. And the Amazon one that went down in Houston was a recent one that pushed that uh, database into existence now. Wow. Okay. Jeez. Wow. Wow. Um, so tell us during the screening process, uh, they're going to, they're going to, you know, go through the psychological test and all that in the psychological test. Could someone play the game so well that if he's like, you know, if he's depressed and he's got dark thoughts and all that, are they able to catch someone right away? Or, you know, or can some people actually outwit these people or uh, give them their, their, their exam? There are always cracks that people are going to get through. You know, where there's a will, there's a way, you know, just like airport security, where there's a will, there's someone that's going to try to get something through and might be successful at it. Um, so let's just put it this way. So once you get past these, those pieces of it, you've still got to go through a lot more training. You're going to go through uh, initial NDOC training. You're going to go through some uh, motionless based SIM training or uh, cockpit procedures training. Then you're also going to go through in cockpit training through a simulator. So you still got to pass a lot of further things and a lot of more tests before you even get to the level when you're actually on an airplane in a cockpit. Wow. And then when you get to the cockpit, you've still got to pass what's con cons considered your initial online experience, IOE. And you have to do all this with Czech Airmen. And, and they're, the part of the valuation of everybody that comes through is still um, evaluating their crew resource management skills, their psycho, psycho evaluation that's going on between the, the crew and how do they work with others and stuff like that. So there's a lot of pieces there that it doesn't mean that somebody couldn't get through, but it's pretty hard. And, and it would have to be very consistent over a long period of time. Because you're talking about three to four months of training right there. There you go. That was my next question coming up, but you beat me to it. Yes. It's yes. a long process, three to four months training. So, yeah, I, I think that within that time span, they pretty much have a pretty good idea who they're dealing with. Yes, very much. And I had this one fellow, as, as you know, Austin, and all the people out there who follow me daily on um, social media. I got my little uh, video clips, Pilot Bob. And through one of those clips, I had someone ask me if, it, if uh, someone is the age, like in the late 50s, if it's too late for him or her to consider becoming a pilot. So I answered um my way and the answer you gave me uh off air was pretty satisfying but now we're on air so i'm going to give you a chance uh, Austin, uh let these people know who are wondering out there if it's too late to become a pilot even though you're in your late 50s uh if you're already a private pilot i would say definitely not um if you're really rambunctious of making this happen you can you can get your 1500 hours in with all your ratings within five years um, some people have done it within three. So you still have a good 10 to 12 years. Oh, you're frozen up. We're experiencing some technical difficulties here. Haas is frozen up. Haas, I don't know if you can hear me on your end. Maybe you can uh, come back into the studio, go out and come back in. So we're experiencing some 
technical difficulties that happens from time to time. That's what you get uh, with internet. It's not always reliable. You're tuned in. The pilot's on the fly. I'm Captain uh, Bob Dallas. I am your host of uh, uh, Pilots on the Fly, co-host with uh, Captain Cartwright. He's the uh, captain on the Boeing 767 on the... Uh, and a freighter. There you go. He's back. So, folks, uh, yeah, sorry about is, that. he probably went through a, a static storm at, uh, what is it, 35,000 feet? <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, back to what we was talking about. I'm not sure where I dropped off at, but, um, you know, a 12 year career right now is not unheard of. And if you're 50, you get your ratings in three to five years and still have 10 to 12 years left. To become an airline is, uh, pilot is not unheard of right now in this pilot shortage world. Okay, and, and we're talking here, someone could aspire actually to be uh, piloting, uh, maybe not to become a captain, but maybe a first officer like in a 777, it's possible? Oh, it's it's even possible to become a captain. Oh, wow. That's some that's, yeah. Okay, so to become a captain... How long does it take? Because let's say you're hired, you come in, uh, it's a month, you're, you're flying, you're a first officer. Before you can aspire to become a captain, how long might it take? Well, you ne remember we're talking about your ATP rating uh, to be able to get into the airlines is going to require 1,500 hours. Now, to be second in command, once you get that ATP rating, it's going to require another a thousand hours minimum of 121 flying um, in the airlines to become another captain. You have to have a, at least a thousand hours of SIC. So wow. It's impossible to still make it. You can do a thousand hours in uh, in just over a year, a year and a half if you're at a real busy airline. What is it that an airline is looking uh, in a pilot that the airline is going to say, okay, uh, he or she is qualified to become a captain. What is it exactly that? What are the what are the uh, traits in a pilot that an airline looks for? Saying, okay, this this fellow, this lady's got leadership. So, what is it exactly that they're looking for? Uh, that is a great question, Bob. Because um, one of those things. Leading uh, uh, people, leading your um, aircraft in, in, in particular situations with experience, um, uh, and understanding weather very much is uh, it. Uh, being, a, being able to be in command of all operations that you're in control of. So um, there's a lot of requirements on top of that. And there's been, um, even in my airline, there's been quite a few captains that have, well, I'd say captain... Um, LGs that have washed out from being a captain because they didn't get through the training and they weren't fit yet to be captain as the, as the training progressed. Okay, all this leads us, okay, the, uh, so you went for a training, you've had an illustrious career, 12 years, you got 12 years out of it, fantastic. The obligatory age for retirement, I believe, is this in, in the entire airline industry or is it like in the U.S. or Canada? My, my take on it is, is that you have to be 65 to be able to retire as an airline pilot. Is that so? That is, the, that is today's age. Um, and I, ICAO's limit has been in place uh, since 2006. Um, 2006 is when they raised it from the age of 60 to 65. And then prior to that, it, um, even before then, the original threshold of a pilot was 45. So they raised it even from 45 to 60, and now from 60 to 65. Now, um, in July 2022, uh, South Carolina Republican uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and uh, a Texas Congressman, Chip Roy, introduced a bill. Um, let ex it's called the Let Experienced Pilots Fly Act. Now, with this bill, we'd see the retirement age from commercial airline pilots raised by two more years to 67. But that would only affect us in America. That would not affect what the world still is at 65. So the ICAO's limit is still 65. If, if America raised it to 67 to try to shorten or, or to lessen the pilot um, shortage, I should say, um, the thinking that could help uh, 
the issues that the airlines are facing with this pilot shortage. But here's a big problem with that. One, they will only be able to fly in America at that point. So all the senior captains typically are that are flying the airlines are flying all over the world. They're flying the trips that they can be done with, you know, fly 12 days and be done with the rest of the month. And, you know, they've got the seniority to be able to do that and do those trips up until the point of 65. And typically if they've been flying for quite a while. Now you take that 65 year old pilot where he's about had a real cushy job and you're going to put him back to flying four and five legs a day in America, just doing short hops. He's not going to like it. He's not going to stick around for that. So I don't see that that will benefit the pilot shortage like the bill thinks it will, or the, even these senators think it will. I think it's going to be a, um, it's going to take a lot more uh, ingenuity than, than just the 65 to 67 age of America to, to help that with that. Do you think by pushing our luck, they might push that eventually if they really, really are stuck? Age seven? You think at age seven, someone's still got all the faculties? I don't think so. Um, I don't think that will happen. Not to say that we don't have some probably age 70 people that could still fly to age 70. Um, I think the issue is going to be, again, these people actually wanting to. You're talking about high-income people that are that were flying cushy job routes that are now having to go back and fly routes that uh, that are less cushy and a lot more work. So I don't think it's going to uh, help with things. And the, the other thing that's happening um, since all the COVID stuff, there has been a quiet push about the medical, um, some of the medical stuff that we have to go through on a regular basis when it comes to uh, your heart and uh, your medical passing every six months that we have to do to go through a medical exam. Now, on the medical side of that, we have to do an EKG at least once a year. And then at a certain age, um, it, it can even become every six months. Now, that's to check your heart and make sure everything's still going well with your heart. Well, there's been some quiet push um, of trying to relax some of the uh, standards of that typical test. Well, not a lot of people are liking that. Um, so there's been some pushback on that. So it's going to be interesting to see how all that plays out. Well, you know... <clears throat> As the, uh, we say in aviation, huh? as time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Folks, this is it. I guess um, we've covered just about everything I had to cover tonight. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thank you to you TikTokers, to the people on LinkedIn, to the people on Facebook and on um, YouTube. And, of course, if you want to follow Haas, our captain, he's on LinkedIn. He's known, he's known as uh, at James Cartwright. If you want to follow him on uh, YouTube, Monkey Wrench Garage. That's at Monkey underscore Wrench underscore Garage. He's got some really nice stuff on there. You guys want to check him out. And as for myself, I'm all over the place, all over social media. Yeah, Pilot Bob Dallas. You can see me everywhere. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Thank you, Captain. Uh, stick around for the traditional uh, meet and greet uh, backstage. We'll be having a little party. We're going to continue a little bit with the TikTokers over here and uh, the people who have tuned in on the uh, other stations. Well, uh, we'll be seeing you soon. So uh, we want to thank Jenny Delane for producing the show. And uh, we'll be around sometime soon. Yes. Good night, everybody. Good to see you guys. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>